We needed something concrete, anything to expose Umbrella to the press, prove the research that was going on down here. What kind of research? The illegal kind, genetic, viral. At the beginning of the 21st century, the Umbrella Corporation had become the largest commercial entity in the United States. Nine out of every 10 homes contain its products. Its political and financial influence is felt everywhere. In public, it is the world's leading supplier of computer technology, medical products, and healthcare. Unknown even to its own employees, its massive profits are generated by military technology, genetic experimentation, and viral weaponry. Listen to me. I want to know who you people are, and I want to know what's going on here. You and I have the same employer. We all work for the Umbrella Corporation. The mansion above us is an emergency entrance to the Hive. And what is the Hive? The Hive itself is located underground, deep beneath the streets of Raccoon City. The Hive houses over 500 technicians, scientists, and support staff. The Hive has its own defense mechanism, all computer control. So you're saying this place was attacked? I'm afraid things are a little more complicated than that. Red Queen is locked onto us. She knows that we're here. Who's the Red Queen? State-of-the-art artificial intelligence. She's the computer that controls the hive. Captain. Dining Hall B. That's what it says on the map. Maybe you're reading it wrong. Maybe the corporation's keeping a few secrets down here. Something you're not supposed to see. Red Queen's defenses are in place. She's making it difficult. Get out! Get out! You can't be in here! Don't listen to anything she says. She's a holographic representation of the Red Queen. I wouldn't advise this. Disabling me will result in loss of primary power. There's anything to stop us from shutting her down. You're all going to die down here. But where did they come from? Why didn't we see them on the way in? Down! When you cut the power, you unlock the doors. You let them out. On the 15th of March 2002, Resident Evil arrived on the big screen in the USA and it hit UK cinemas in July. Directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, most famous for directing the most successful video game adaptation, Mortal Kombat, in 1995, and the sci-fi horror Event Horizon. Budgeted at $33 million, it was a financial success, making $101 million worldwide, but received mostly negative reviews from the critics and fans of the popular video game series. Empire Magazine awarded it 2 out of 5, saying game fans will be disappointed, zombie fans will be disappointed, and Paul Anderson fans will be disappointed. If you want scary, boot up your games console. Roger Ebert put it on the list of his worst movies, also including its sequel, Apocalypse. Fans criticised its lack of violence compared to the gory video game, and fans complained that the movie chose not to focus on the characters from the series they loved, and the filmmakers decided to cherry-pick events from the series, avoiding a direct adaptation. To the surprise of many people, in 2014, director James Cameron named Resident Evil his biggest guilty pleasure. Despite the negative reviews and displeasure from the fans, the series found an audience with moviegoers who weren't that familiar with the game series, and it spawned five sequels which were all profitable. The series came to an end in 2017, but this wasn't the last of Resident Evil and its cinematic adventures, as Netflix announced they were doing an eight-episode series set in Raccoon City. A new animated movie and the film series would also be getting a reboot, returning to the events of the first two games, with it being scheduled for release in 2021. The rights to make a movie based on the video game were purchased in 1997, after the game's initial release by German production company Constantine Film. They hired Alan McElroy to pen the first script. Alan had written Halloween 4, Rapid Fire, Todd McFarlane's Spawn series, and would later write 2003's Wrong Turn. The news of Alan's involvement was covered in PlayStation and film magazines around that time. The leaked reports indicated that Alan's script had followed the game very closely, but had no mention of Umbrella or stars who were sent in to investigate. 
Instead, the plot was about a special forces team sent by the government to rescue scientists from the mansion laboratory after the SWAT team that was sent in earlier were killed, but during the story they would realise that the entire mission was a trap for them and that they are specimens in a medical experiment. McElroy's script was ultimately rejected on the grounds that the second game had come out in 1998 and the producers felt that a movie based on the first game would now seem dated. In 1998, the late George A. Romero directed a television commercial for the video game Resident Evil 2 that was shown exclusively in Japan. The original game's director, Shinji Mikami, was a fan of Romero and had been influenced by his Night of the Living Dead series. Sony were impressed with his work and offered him a chance to direct the movie, as they had shown an interest distributing it in the USA. George had to familiarise himself with the first game and got his secretary to play it and record the gameplay so he could study it. Romero's screenplay would follow the events of the first game featuring Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine as the leads. And also it featured Barry Burton, Rebecca Chambers, Ada Wong who appeared in Resident Evil 2 and the main villain Albert Wesker. He went through five drafts, changing it to suit the wishes of the producers, but George admitted they just didn't like his script when he was interviewed for Fangoria magazine. He also added further, saying, They'd brought the game, but I don't think they knew what it was. The head of the company just didn't understand it, doesn't even know what a video game is. He wanted it to be something different. I mean, this is the guy who made Das Boot, so he wanted something prestigious. I told him that's not the spirit of the game. They also felt George's script was too violent, terrified they would get an NC-17 in the USA and would struggle to make a profit. So writer Kevin Williamson was approached to write a new script. Kevin had worked on Scream and The Faculty. The plot of his script was much closer to the events of Resident Evil 2 and 3, taking place in the near future where all the diseases in the world are cured thanks to Umbrella. But once they are in danger from losing money, they create the T-Virus and hold the world to ransom. However, the virus leaks out from their labs and into Raccoon City. The Stars team is sent to retrieve the antivirus and would have to fight their way through and out of the city battling monsters created by the T-Virus. It was unclear why Kevin's script was rejected, but I imagine down to the cost. In 1995, Paul W.S. Anderson directed Mortal Kombat, which was a success with critics and at the box office. Paul found himself being offered many video game properties to bring to the big screen, but turned them down. But after playing Resident Evil, which he admitted playing for months on end as he went through the trilogy on the PlayStation, Anderson saw its cinematic potential and wrote a script titled Undead, which he described as a ripoff of the game. Paul's producer Jeremy Bolt was instructed to see if he can get the rights, not realising Constantine had already acquired them. With the production laying dormant for nearly a year, the head of Constantine Film was enthusiastic to hear Paul's pitch. Whereas the previous attempts at adapting Resident Evil had adhered closely to one or more of the games, Anderson took a different approach entirely, coming up with the concept of a prequel. Paul said the games had a wide range of characters and different storylines, which made it a challenge to translate into one film, and didn't want to alienate the fans of the sequels. He felt that if he did translate the first game, it would be predictable. Why don't you just play the game instead? Also, as the game focused on diary notes and reports, it would be very dull to watch. So he introduced a computer that would talk to fill in this information. The film would lay out the groundwork for the Resident Evil universe, and explains what went on before the game's events. Paul said, what we are trying to do is make a movie that works within the universe of Resident Evil and doesn't contradict it. So you're not giving the fans the game as a movie, you're giving them a new adventure. The producers were impressed and got Anderson to develop his rip-off script into a fully-fledged Resident Evil movie, which he titled Resident Evil Ground Zero. In late 2000, Paul Anderson was announced as director and writer, and Resident Evil re-entered pre-production stages. When it came to casting the main characters, Paul wanted to focus on the female heroes of the series. Instead of the story focusing on Jill and Claire, he introduced new leads with Alice and Rain. For Alice, he cast Mila Jovovich, best known for her performances in The Fifth Element, and Joan of Arc. Alice is part of the security team that live in the mansion above the hive. Mila was familiar with the games as she had played them with her brother. While filming the movie, Mila was on set for as long as 16 hours a day, with some of those days spent repeatedly jumping in and out of freezing cold water, or jumping on metal grates. Leading up to the release of the movie, Mila told Fangoria that it was one of the most difficult shoots of her career. Mila began a relationship with the director Paul Anderson while making the movie, and they got married in 2009. Michelle Rodriguez plays as Rain, one of the short-tempered commandos sent into the hive. Michelle was also familiar with the games and was excited to become a zombie in the film. 
Resident Evil was made in the early stages of her career, and she became a familiar face of the Fast and the Furious series, and starred in the highly successful Avatar. Michelle would return to the series in Resident Evil 5 Retribution. James Purefoy plays as Spence, Alice's partner who has his own desires to steal Umbrella's secrets and sell them to the highest bidder. James started out his career in TV before making the leap to film, such as Mansfield Park and other movies such as John Carter, High Rise, Churchill, and appeared in the recent series Pennyworth. Eric Mabius plays as Matthew, who is seeking information on Umbrella's illegal activities and is searching for his sister who was sent into the hive undercover to get the vital information. Eric appeared in the awful Crow Salvation, but is best known for his role in the TV series and spin-off movies Signed, Sealed, Delivered. Heike Makash plays as Lisa, Matthew's sister, who early on is trapped in the hive and infected with the T-virus, turning her into a zombie. You may recognise Heike from Love Actually. Colin Salmon plays as James One Shade, the head of the commandos working for Umbrella. Colin appeared in Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough, and worked again with Paul Anderson on Alien vs Predator. Colin still works steadily today on TV, appearing in shows such as Silent Witness and Krypton. He would also return in Retribution. Martin Cruz plays as Kaplan, who is part of the commando team and is needed to hack into the Red Queen and reactivate the system so they can get the secret lab back up and running, but doesn't realise once he reboots the system, it will free all the monsters. Martin was a familiar face of Australian TV, appearing in the show Neighbours, and did work again on another video game movie, Dead or Alive. Pascal Aliadi stars as JD, another member of the team and appears to be close friends with Rain. JD gets attacked early on as he attempts to flee from the first wave of zombies. Pascal is a big star of German TV and film. Resident Evil will be his first international movie. We also have a small cameo of Jason Isaacs as the narrator and the Doctor who appears at the end. Jason is of course a friend of Paul Anderson's and worked with him on Event Horizon and Soldier. In early March of 2001, it was announced that half the movie would be shot in Berlin and its surroundings, and the rest would be shot in Toronto to keep costs down. During production, professional dancers were hired to star as zombies, as they had better control of their body movements. Anderson told the actors to move however they thought a zombie would, given their conditions. Whilst filming, there was a shortage of dancers to represent the required numbers of the undead as some scenes required large amounts of them, so other crew members got to play the zombies, such as Capcom's executives and several of the film's producers, including Jeremy Bolt and his sister Anna. As this was a Resident Evil movie, Paul wanted to have many visual elements to keep it in the same universe and capture its style. Anderson had stated that the film's camera angles and several shots allude to the video game's own camera angles. The close-up of Alice's eye is done as a direct reference to the title screen of the first game. The film would be structured around opening doors like the game would, as it would load the next scene. You as the player don't know what was going to be in that room, so Paul wanted to capture that sense of suspense. The opening scene in the mansion tries to capture as much as they can from the first game, with the crows opening drawers and finding weapons locked away and needing a password, a statue that appears similar to the one in the game as well. Once they enter the hive, we have the dogs, which was a constant request of the fans at the time for Paul to feature. We also have some elements from Resident Evil 2, such as the train and the liquor monster. There are other Easter eggs hidden throughout, but as it becomes a new adventure set in this universe, it throws in new surprises. By the time of summer 2001 was coming to an end, most of Resident Evil had already been shot but members of the production crew and Mila needed to go to Toronto to film the closing moment set in Raccoon City, but shooting had to be postponed in the wake of the September 11th attacks. Paul Anderson said the event had a huge impact on him and was one of the reasons the film dropped the ground zero from its original title. Paul was also unhappy with the ending. At first it seemed too costly to have a city left in chaos and it seemed a bit depressing, so we shot a more upbeat version, setting it six months later with Mila going to Umbrella to rescue Matthew, looking very Matrix inspired. Paul felt it just didn't work again, so he thankfully returned to his original ending with Alice waking up in a hospital and walking out into Raccoon City that has been ravished by the zombie outbreak. He liked the bleak ending and it felt familiar to how sci-fi films ended in the 70s. 
Paul made it clear early on that he didn't want to make a PG-13 rated movie. He said the fans would have hated it and been upset with the filmmakers. During shooting their aim was for an R rated film, but it was still slapped with an NC-17 when submitted to the MPAA. Cuts were made to trim the violence down. Paul had indicated in various interviews that an uncut version with several minutes of extra footage, including gorier scenes and more character development, will be released in future as a possible DVD release. But to date, this has never happened. For the film's story, it opens with scientists working in a secret lab for Umbrella, which is hidden underneath Raccoon City. A lethal virus breaks out and the hive falls into lockdown, and the staff are trapped and killed off by the system, which is run by an AI called the Red Queen. We find Alice waking up in a bathroom. It appears she has passed out and she is struggling to collect her thoughts, suffering from amnesia. She gets dressed and checks out the mansion and suddenly an unknown person charges into her, and a group of commandos seize the building. Alice and the man revealed to be Matthew are taken down to the hive with the commandos. They locate a train and find Spence, hidden inside and also suffering from memory loss. The commandos explain that everyone in the group except Matt is an employee of the Umbrella Corporation, and Alice and her partner Spence were assigned to guard the hive's secret entrance under the mansion. They get to the command centre where the Red Queen is located. They attempt to unlock the system, but her defences kick in, killing Shade and three others of the team. The others are shocked but need to complete the mission. Kaplan eventually disables the system. The Red Queen appears as a hologram of a little girl. She warns them not to reset the system, but Kaplan ignores her shutting off the power, so to get the controls back online. But once the power is shut off, all the doors unlock, unleashing the zombies and creatures infected by the T-Virus. When everyone regroups, they are ambushed by a horde of zombies. Rain is bitten and her partner JD is killed as the group is overwhelmed. Rain retreats with Kaplan and Spence as they manage to lock the zombies out. Matt and Alice get separated and Alice walks into a laboratory and she is starting to regain her memories. Matt is trying to find his sister Lisa and finds her zombified. Alice saves him in the nick of time. Matt explains he and Lisa were environmental activists and Lisa infiltrated Umbrella to smuggle out the evidence of their illegal experiments. Alice remembers she was Lisa's contact in the hive, but decides not to tell Matthew. The survivors head to the Red Queen's chamber, where they find out they only have one hour left before the hive traps them inside for good, and they are unaware the liquor is on its way. The visual effects for Resident Evil would be supervised by industry expert Richard Urisic, who worked on Star Trek The Motion Picture and Blade Runner. Richard had worked with Paul on Event Horizon. The computer film company, who was owned by Framestore, handled most of the workload. The film has a mix of computer-generated effects, animatronics and miniatures. The makeup and creature effects would be supervised by Pauline Fowler. She had worked on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Alien vs Predator and Cloud Atlas. For the liquor that transforms at the end and becomes more aggressive, they created two large-scale puppets. One that could be used as a battering ram that would smash through doors and windows, and the second one had animatronics to give them more control over its arms and face and would be used for close-ups only, as they didn't construct a fully formed liquor, as it would be doubled in CGI. When it came to the dogs, it became challenging trying to apply the makeup onto them. No one had ever tried to create a decomposing dog before, and adding congealed blood on the dog, they would shake or attempt to lick it off. The close-ups that required Mila to attack them, they would use a puppet. Probably the most memorable scene from the film was the laser chamber that cuts through a group of commandos. To show their bodies falling apart, especially for the leader of the team, they built a full-scale model of him and had it fall apart in chunks. It's never shown in full due to the violence, but the efforts that went into visualising this moment within camera has to be applauded. A miniature unit in London built a model of the Umbrella train for the sequences during the final battle and as it travels along the track to the hive. Due to the somewhat modest budget the film had, it was seen as a low-budget affair if you compared it to most big blockbusters from that period, so the visual effects, especially the CGI representation of the liquor, has dated very badly. To be honest, I recall not being impressed by its introduction when I first saw it back on DVD. They certainly did a better job visualising them for the sequel. The zombies don't quite have the detail and believability we see in something like The Walking Dead, but overall the effects do a serviceable job. The score to Resident Evil was composed by Marco Beltrami and Marilyn Manson. Paul W. Sanson was a big fan of John Carpenter's earlier scores for films such as Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween and Escape from New York. He wanted to capture the spirit of those scores and provide an intense electro soundtrack. 
Paul chose Marco due to being impressed by his work on various horror films such as Scream and Mimic. Marco not being a huge fan of horror seemed to be continuously getting work in the genre. He would compose the traditional side of the score to Resident Evil providing ambient themes. Manson was excited to be part of the production and wanted to make something unlike his traditional music but still wanted it to be exciting. Paul felt these musicians would complement each other with their different styles. Manson would use heavy guitar elements for the introduction of the commandos and the battle with the zombies. Then more atmospheric moments would have a melodic sound design to enhance those scenes. He gave the Red Queen a childish waltz and modified it to sound more menacing when she returns to explain the T-Virus. As Marco Beltrami wrote music traditionally, Manson said he worked as a sound designer, manipulating frequencies and recordings of instruments to get the effects he wanted. The main theme was written with the idea of Alice in Wonderland being thrown into a world of decay and biological warfare, and is certainly the most recognisable piece of music from the film, and probably the film series overall. The score by Marco Beltrami was never officially released, and can be sourced online in bootleg form. What we got on the album that was put out on CD in March of 2002 and is still easy to get hold of today contains a number of tracks composed by Marilyn Manson and additional songs from artists such as Cold Chamber, Rammstein, Depeche Mode and Slipknot. A music video was produced for the Slipknot song My Plague. The main theme is definitely my favourite part of the score. That nursery rhyme sort of approach to it fits so well with Resident Evil and could easily be implemented into the video game series. The emotionless, rigid, heavy guitarist for the Commandos is a great piece of music that works well on its own. A lot of the additional material by Marco is a bit hit and miss, however. The opening music in the mansion with Alice walking around has little nods here and there to the original video game music. It's nice to hear that, but the rest doesn't really leave a lasting impression. The music for the video games, for example Resident Evil 1 and 2, have lots of strong recognisable themes, which are sadly missing from the film's score, and what we got does the job in areas, but could have been so much better. When the film came out I decided not to go see it at the cinema after I flicked through Empire and Total Film magazines and the reviews were less than impressive. Word of mouth had spread highlighting that it was disappointing and had little connection to the video game. I did eventually watch it when it came out on DVD and found it a frustrating experience. Now Paul W. Sanderson has made the most successful video game movie with Mortal Kombat which did a great job of capturing the feel and look of the game. It was missing all the fatalities that made the game what it was. It was understandable that they couldn't release a gory movie. They would alienate a large chunk of the audience and with the industry being a business to make money, they wanted to maximise profits and the same goes with Resident Evil, with it being given a 15 rating, so younger fans could get the chance to see it on the big screen, but it still felt like a tame version of George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead series. On my first viewing I noticed it certainly took elements from the game, Umbrella and its business tactics of dealing with biological warfare and the T-Virus. The mansion, even though the exterior looks nothing like the one featured in the game, and honestly looks a bit too small. Inside, thankfully, it looked familiar. It features zombies, the dog, a liquor, and the train from Resident Evil 2. Maps are featured like in the game and are there to help the audience know where the characters are going, and a nod to Resident Evil 3 with a mention of the Nemesis Project. That wraps up the movie, with the zombie outbreak that destroys Raccoon City. But the film had no recognisable characters from the game, such as Chris, Jill, Barry, and Wesker. The film does indicate they plan to reopen the hive at the end to find out what happened, so this could be a nod to the stars team being sent in to investigate. I do understand Paul's reasonings to do a prequel, but seeing something different with new characters felt like it wasn't really Resident Evil. Mortal Kombat worked because it had all the characters we knew. Of course Liu Kang was going to beat Shang Tsung at the end, but the fun factor came from seeing the game come to life, and not doing the same for Resident Evil felt like a letdown for me as a fan. I was impressed with Melia's performance in The Fifth Element. Luc Besson managed to get the best out of her as an actor, but for her work in Resident Evil and its subsequent sequels, she is so wooden and mostly emotionless throughout, making the character of Alice very forgettable. This is probably the fault of Paul's writing. I think he has always struggled to write characters with any sort of depth. They always come across as very two-dimensional stock characters. One's aggressive, one's paranoid, one's nerdy for example. It's just simple traits his characters seem to be defined by. Mila can get away with looking confused or lacking any emotions throughout the movie, due to her lack of memory and trying to remind herself what happened. That innocent look she has near the beginning, it works for her and by the end she has a better control of the situation to save herself and the others, but as we return to her character throughout the series, she just becomes this superhero who manages to cut through monsters and bad guys with ease, destroying any sort of tension. 
The action scenes are sadly underwhelming and a bit boring. The first zombie attack sequence is fine, but the use of heavy metal guitar riffs over the top of the sound mix sort of takes out the scares, and it becomes this attack on your ears as we have characters talking, firing their machine guns, and then the music is blaring at you. It makes things a bit messy. Alice's fight with the dog starts out really well, as she hears something coming around the corner, then the zombie dog turns up and chases her. She then gets jumped by a zombie, beats him up, and then Hurricane kicks the dog. That makes them the film only features three monsters essentially, zombies, dogs and a liquor. They didn't bother with the big spiders, the snake and hunters, so it's a bit light on enemies for Alice and the team to face up against. Having the liquor be the final big monster at the end felt so disappointing at the time. No giant tyrant to battle, the liquor randomly gets bigger once it eats someone, which didn't happen in the game and becomes this giant lump of meat, as it then battles them on the train becoming this nod to Resident Evil 2. A big issue I have with the script is that it just relies on big dumps of exposition, which is done to address the lengthy diary notes and messages that you, the player, discover in the game. In the film, they stop to have a chat and explain what the mission is and what they are going to do and attempt to flesh out the backstories of Mila and Spence. Despite all this information, we never actually get to know these characters properly to be fully invested in what's going on. As a fan of the video game franchise, I wanted a movie set in the mansion and let the story unfold slowly to lead us to the laboratory underground, to where they discover the tyrant. In the film we spend but 10 minutes in the mansion, if that, as it quickly jumps into the hive to spend its time going through many different locations that all seemed a bit jumbled up, as the geography is a bit confusing, on purpose I think, as they wanted to create this labyrinth, but it seems so straightforward from the maps they show us. Paul, to give him credit, does make efforts to put the camera in specific angles to copy the game, and plays this out slowly and it looks spot on. Paul is a frustrating director. I honestly think he is a super nice guy. You could happily get a few beers with him and chat about movies, but when it comes to him making films, his writing really lets him down. His best movies are the ones that he hasn't written. Aside from probably Death Race, he has handled a lot of popular IPs, such as this and AVP, and as a result upset a lot of the fan base. He can provide some great visuals and slick looking movies, but they just seem so throwaway or lack any emotional angle for them to be generally considered good movies. Paul makes films often for a modest budget and they are successful at the box office and on DVD. He seems to capture the international market. His films hit so well with non-English speaking countries, where in the USA and the UK his movies are often torn apart by the critics and don't seem to make much of an impact. As a big fan of the games, I find the live action movie series to be mostly awful. The final chapter has some of the worst editing I've seen in a modern movie. Throughout the series, the action scenes are annoying to watch, editing is too fast, or they cover everything in close-ups, as many of the actors aren't trained martial artists. Loads of unnecessary slow motion. Once they started shooting in 3D, you have a number of scenes trying to push those 3D visuals, and the plot is just the same thing over and over again. But I can't deny there are some good moments here and there. I don't mind part 3 as it has director Russell Mulcahy behind the camera. I loved his work on Highlander and The Shadow, and the story makes up for the poor efforts of part 2, but come part 4 they drop the idea the world has turned to a Mad Max style wasteland. If you just enjoy them as just throwaway entertainment, the schlock and cheese factor is high in this series, and can be enjoyed for that, but for successfully capturing the spirit of the games they really struggle. As they throw continuity out the window, everything changes with each sequel, they throw in characters from the game to please the fans, but most of the time they don't act like the characters we know and love, they are just there by name only. The first movie is certainly not the weakest out of the series, and has some elements that I like, but still, and even at the time, I felt it should have followed the first game more closely. That same year we saw the remake of the original PlayStation game on the GameCube, which was highly praised for its update to the story to really flesh it out, and its amazing graphics to create a very cinematic experience. This just trumped everything that was in the film. If say for example you look at the first Silent Hill movie, that did a far better job of capturing that game than Resident Evil did, and did a great job with the horror and suspense. There is loads more to explore with Resident Evil again on the big and even small screen, and I look forward to see what happens in future. I know there are fans of this movie franchise with Mila in the lead, but they just never clicked with me. I wanted to try and get into them. I sometimes have those urges to give them another go, but once I put on one of the many sequels, I just get annoyed very quickly. It's just not my cup of tea. The film is definitely a guilty pleasure for some, 
others like myself feel it's a wasted opportunity to really give the game a movie it deserves. Ah, there you are. Things I gather have gone out of control. Tell us what the hell is going on down here. Research and development. What about the T-virus? The T-virus was a major medical breakthrough, although it clearly also possessed highly profitable military applications. Well, how does it explain those things out there? Even in death, the human body still remains active. It reanimates the body. It brings the dead back to life? Not fully. The subjects have the simplest of modes of functions. They are driven by the basest of impulses, the most basic of needs. Which is? The need to feed. I couldn't allow it to escape from the hive. You must understand. Those who become infected, I can't allow you to leave. Whoa, we're, we're not infected. Just one bite, one scratch from these creatures is sufficient. And then you become one of them. We can still make it out of here. Come with me. We can have everything we've ever wanted. Money's out there, waiting. You wouldn't believe how much. We worked for the same company. You knew what they did. I was trying to stop them. Oh, my God. One of the hive's early experiments, produced by injecting the T-virus directly into living tissue, the results were unstable. Now that it has fed on fresh DNA, it will mutate, becoming a stronger, faster hunter. If you knew it was loose, why didn't you warn us? Because she was saving it. Yes. Mutating. Ah!